Okay. Thanks um, to the organizers for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. And uh, like um, was said, I'll be talking about uh, a mes mes approximate message passing algorithms for uh, inference and estimation. So um, the high level idea is uh, the, the following. With modern computing, uh, many fields now have lots of data to work with. And so um, they now use that data to construct uh, more complex statistical models than we've ever really looked at before. And what this requires is new methodolo methodologies and mathematical techniques for the analysis of such models. So what I'm going to talk about um, today is sort of a prototype a prototypical problem in this area, which is just our sort of simple high dimensional linear regression problem. And in particular, um, I'm going to, to uh, sort of uh, look a little bit at the algorithmic side of um, what Mark was talking about earlier and um, study uh, some kind of new work in the finite sample analysis of approximate message passing algorithms. Okay, so my high dimensional um, linear regression model is going to look like uh, the following. Um, so I'm gonna assume I have some output Y, which I'm thinking is some length M vector. Um, and Y is actually going to be a linear combination of some unknown vector beta uh, that, that's hit with some noise. So um, my goal, right, is to recover my unknown vector or signal beta from these noisy linear measurements. Right? And this is a hard problem because it's, it's a high dimensional problem. So the matrix, the measurement matrix A that's giving me my noisy linear measurements is going to be short and wide. Right? So um, we can't just sort of you know, do the, the usual least squares thing, x transpose x inverse, x transpose y, because, you know, now we have our, our short and, and uh, matrix A. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to focus on, on this problem. Um, it's a problem that, that most people I'm sure have, have studied before, but um, a lot of the ideas will extend to, to other settings, and I'll try to touch on that a little bit um, at the end. So of course there are uh, numerous applications for such high dimensional linear regression problems. Um, I won't go into to many of the, the details, but these sorts of problems are seen all the time in imaging, um, in statistics and machine learning, right? Where A is actually a data matrix and beta is a vector of, of coefficients. Um, or in you know, uh, one of my uh, favorite applications, which is channel coding and uh, communication. So um, in general, you know, I'm, I'm kind of abstracting away from these applications, but I'm thinking about uh, problems where the, the sizes are large. So things like the computational complexity of the reconstruction algorithm um, is, is something that we're going to concern ourselves with. So um, as it stands without some sort of structural assumption on the vector beta, Right? This is a problem that, that uh, is, is something we, we can't solve. There are an infinite number of betas that would uh, give us a solution. So um, the, the usual uh, uh, assumption or the usual approach is to, to assume some sort of additional information about the structure of beta. And a common um, assumption is that of, of sparsity. So uh, what we might assume is that, that beta is either exactly or approximately case sparse, meaning that, you know, most of its uh, uh, elements are exactly equal to zero, but k of them are, are, are non-zero. <laughs> so um, if we were to assume a k-sparse beta, right, and our goal is to re reconstruct this k-sparse beta from our noisy linear model, right, um, one thing we, we might want to do is to solve some sort of uh, optimization program like the following, where we minimize the sum of the squared errors, right? But we're subject to a constraint on the number of non-zeros in the problem. Yeah. So of course, um, this is uh, unfortunately a very hard uh, combinatorial problem. It uh, essentially amounts to a brute force search over the, um, the, the k non-zeros. So uh, the, the sort of usual approach 
is um, the lasso, right? We relax the L0 constraint uh, to an L1 constraint. So now what we'd like to, to solve is a, a minimization of the following form, right? We wanna minimize our sum of squared errors subject to a constraint on the magnitudes of the elements of the unknown vector uh, beta. Right. And so um, this problem has been studied a lot uh, starting around 2006, right? Um, and so uh, there's been a lot of good work that, that's been done in the area that convinces us that this is a reasonable approach, right? So, um, you know, in, in particular, if A satisfies some conditions, um, related to the, the orthogonality of the, the columns, um, for example, a restricted isometry property, then we know that we can get a good estimate of a sparse vector beta by solving this, this program. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so throughout, I'm going to refer to, to this optimization program as, as the lasso. And um, when I'm talking about this high dimensional regression problem with a sparse vector beta, I'm going to refer to it as, as compressed sensing. And so um, starting around 2006, there was a lot of good work that was done uh, in this area. So there were many successful applications for um, the compressed sensing ideas. There were fast algorithms for optimizing this, this cost function and um, scaling laws, information theoretic uh, results about the measurements required to recover the true sparse vector beta. But um, there, were, there were some challenges uh, in particular, a lot of the analysis that we saw only provided bounds that were sometimes conservative. Um, the methods were specific to the lasso and maybe didn't generalize well. Um, these results lacked uh, theoretically op optimal estimates, or, or, or sorry, the, the sort of um, results about when we can achieve theoretically optimal estimates. So I'm thinking about things like uh, MMSE estimates. And um, there was limited insight on the actual distribution of the vector that was recovered by the lasso, which um, was needed, for example, if we wanted to do some sort of inference on the, the, the variable selections. So um, approximate message passing is a low, uh, a low complexity scalable algorithm um, that, was studied, that was studied extensively in this compressed sensing setting. And um, it has a lot of nice benefits. And in particular, it can help us address some of these challenges um, that were originally sort of, of noticed uh, in compressed sensing. So um, some of the, the benefits of AMP uh, are the following. So for certain random matrices, in particular those that are IID Gaussian or sub-Gaussian, um, it converges very fast. Uh, it uh, lends itself to an asymptotically exact characterization. And um, there are testable conditions for optimality. So um, I'm going to focus most on sort of this, this second bullet point, uh, the, the sort of asymptotically exact characterization of uh, the AMP algorithms. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe say a few things about the, the other two. So, um, you know, though uh, the, the AMP methods have been studied extensively for compressed sensing, um, and, uh, you know, uh, as Mark mentioned, when they became AMP instead of TAP, uh, this was sort of with the sort of surge of the compressed sensing uh, literature. But it turns out that the theory for the AMP algorithms uh, provides insight to many more complex models. So things like GLMs that we touched on earlier, um, in particular logistic regression, but also things like phase retrieval, multi-layer models, PCA, or, or optimization. Again, for, for, for the first part, at least, of my talk, I'm going to focus mostly on compressed sensing. So um, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit more about the AMP algorithm for the lasso, and then I'll introduce the, the general AMP algorithms, and then say something about um, 
their state evolution and their, their performance guarantees. So um, before I introduce AMP for Lasso, uh, I'm just going to review uh, some of the, the sort of standard for first order methods for solving the, the Lasso. So, um, okay, so if we want to solve uh, this optimization problem, it's a little bit of a challenge, right? Because uh, though it's convex, the second term over here isn't differentiable, right? So, um, you know, something like a vanilla gradient descent uh, isn't going to, to help us here. But um, it's, uh, we're lucky because, you know, uh, proximal gradient descent is a generalization of gradient descent that's, you know, uh, uh, used to solve cost functions exactly of this form. So um, at a high level, I'm gonna talk about a few first order methods, in particular proximal gradient descent, and then a fast iterative soft thresholding that's sort of a Nesterov's method. Um, and they all work by iteratively generating updates of the unknown vector beta, and I'm going to call those, those updates beta one, beta two, and so on. And it turns out AMP is the same sort of method. It's going to work by iteratively generating updates of the unknown vector beta. So um, proximal gradient descent, or, or um, what's sometimes called iterative soft thresholding when we're talking about lasso, uh, takes the following simple form. It's a two-step algorithm. At every iteration, it calculates a, a residual, right? So this is just your standard residual. And then it uses that residual to update its estimate of the unknown vector beta through the soft thresholding function, right? And so you'll remember the soft thresholding function is just the function that uh, within the threshold sets its input exactly equal to zero and beyond the threshold pushes it back towards zero. Okay. So um, what I'm thinking of is, is this, this applies element-wise to the vector input, right? I've colored the input green there because it turns out that this is an important term for the AMP algorithms that we'll see again. Um, and the convergence of the, the proximal gradient is controlled by the step size S. So as long as S is small enough, uh, we know that the uh, proximal gradient will lead us to um, a, a local minimum. So um, proximal gradient is, is good, right? It, it works. Um, and it turns out that we can uh, speed up the, the convergence of the proximal gradient algorithms by just a small tweak to the algorithm. Um, so here, uh, we're looking at fast iterative soft thresholding, which is uh, one of Nesterov's uh, ideas that now just uses a momentum term. So now um, we're calculating our residual, not with the previous estimate, but with some uh, uh, sort of weighted term between the, the previous two estimates. And um, this has, uh, you know, many of the same guarantees as the proximal gradient algorithm, but it, fa it converges um, more quickly. So um, the idea, uh, with the approximate message passing algorithms is, is the following, right? Um, FISTA is good, but we're wondering if we can use some sort of message passing algorithm to address the issues that, that were raised earlier. So uh, can we get an asymptotically exact characterization? What is the ac optimal estimate and can we achieve it? And when can we achieve it? And um, is it possible to get even faster convergence as, as n grows large? So um, AMP algorithms uh, are derived as approximations of loopy belief propagation algorithms for dense vector graphs. So uh, Mark went through um, the details of this uh, earlier, so I'm, I'm not going to, to sort of um, weigh us down with the math, but I'll give you a high level idea of, of what's, what's happening. So um, the derivation uh, uses the following assumptions. So we assume that our measurement matrix A is IID um, column normalized Gaussian, and also that the dimensions of A are large, and we're in this linear asymptotic regime. 
So um, the, the derivation uh, at a high level looks like uh, the following. So you'll remember that these message passing algorithms act on an undirected um, graph where the messages are sent over the edges at each iteration t. So here I'm thinking about a factor graph representing my high dimensional linear regression problem where I have variable nodes for each element of beta and I have factor nodes uh, M factor nodes for each of my measurements. So um, we use local rules to update the message. So this is just the idea that outgoing messages from any vertex are functions of incoming messages to that vertex at the previous time, except for the message along the edge that we'd like to, to send. Um, so what I'm describing is kind of a general class of uh, dynamical systems only requiring locality in this non-backtracking um, idea. But it, it turns out that if the graph is a tree or if it's locally tree-like, then it has some very nice properties. And also um, these sorts of message passing algorithms have found numerous uh, applications. So as was mentioned earlier, um, AMP can be thought of as a limit of the message passing algorithms um, in the large system limit. So again, I'm thinking of the problem size getting big with the ratio of the dimensions being a constant. Um, when the underlying graph is completely dense, right? So if you think about the factor graph representing our um, high dimensional linear regression problem, right? This is going to be a completely dense factor graph because our A matrix is IID Gaussian. None of the elements are, are equal to zero. So um, when we take this, this limit uh, for the, the factor graph representing the, the problem we're looking at, we get the, the following AMP algorithm. So again, it works to iteratively update estimates, beta one, beta two, and so on. Um, and it has the, the following form. At every iteration, uh, we calculate two values. One is a, a, your standard residual with a correction term here in red. And then using that residual, it uh, again updates the estimate using the soft thresholding function. So here, right, the, the RT is our residual term. It's now updated with a correction, which can be thought of as a momentum term like uh, Nesterov's method. And um, we've again colored this, this term in green because I'm going to call it the effective observation. So um, we can compare this to the iterative soft thresholding, right? They're, they're quite similar. So uh, the iterative soft thresholding right, uh, calculates the residual without the correction, and then it updates the estimate using the, the soft thresholding. But there are some slight differences, right? So one, we have the correction term up here, and secondly, uh, iterative soft thresholding controls the convergence with the step size, while um, the AMP algorithms are controlling uh, the convergence in some sense by, uh, changing the threshold and the soft thresholding algorithm with the, the iteration number. Yep. So how is it? How is what, excuse the, me? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's going to be chosen proportional to the um, state evolution values, which I, I think it'll become, uh, give me one more slide and uh, I think this all makes sense. Um, so, the, the presence of this correction term uh, gives AMP a really nice statistical property. So again, under the, the same assumptions I was dealing with earlier, where A is IID uh, Gaussian and, and the dimensions of A are large, we have this nice um, sort of statistical uh, fact about this effective observation. So um, what it says is that uh, my effective observation, so again, this term I'm coloring in green that comes in here as the input to the soft thresholding function is approximately equal to the truth, so the thing I'd like to recover 
viewed an independent Gaussian noise, so plus independent Gaussian noise, where uh, the variance of this noise I'm calling tau t. And this is a deterministic value that I, I, I know um, by the state evolution of the AMP algorithm. So uh, the state evolution is a recursive sequence that I'll introduce in a, a few slides, but it's, it's basically just a, sort of a scalar equation that I have access to, right? Um, so uh, to uh, your question, right, so if, if if this is true, if we know that this is approximately the truth plus Gaussian noise with variance tau t squared, and I'm thinking about thresholding, right, uh, something proportional to tau t is going to be what I want to do. So this ends up looking like alpha times tau t, uh, where alpha is related to lambda in my original problem. Okay. So, um, Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do is give you some empirical evidence that, that this claim is, uh, is, is valid. So um, what we've done here is uh, plotted a number of, of sort of realizations of this problem. So um, here I, I have an A matrix that's 2,000 by 4,000, so it's short and wide. This means my vector beta has length 4,000. Uh, 500 of the elements of beta are non-zero. They're going to be equal probable plus or minus one. And so what I've plotted is the histogram of my effective observation at the 10th iteration uh, for the indices where the, the original signal was equal to plus one, right? So my claim here was that this uh, effective observation is approximately equal to the truth viewed in Gaussian noise, right? So what does this mean? If, if beta zero is plus one, then what I want is a, a histogram that looks like a Gaussian centered at one with, with some variance. Right? Um, but I've plotted two histograms. So one is the histogram of the effective observation when I run AMP, and the other is the histogram for the effective observation when I run the iterative soft thresholding. Mm -hmm. So um, if we look at the histogram for AMP, right, so again, the, the, the elements in the histogram are uh, independent problem uh, problems that I've simulated. Mm -hmm. When I look at the, the histogram for AMP, right, it, it, it looks approximately Gaussian, right? It's, it's centered at the, the, um, the correct place, right? Uh, I've overlaid the Gaussian density. It looks roughly symmetric, unimodal, these, these things I'd like to see in a Gaussian histogram. On the other hand, right, you can kind of tell that, that uh, we don't have the same distributional property, at least in this example, for the iterative soft thresholding, right? We're centered somewhere that's that's off from the truth, which is plus one, and it, it looks that we have kind of a, a, a an anti-symmetry to, uh, to our histogram. So um, here I've, I've given you sort of just an empirical observation at a single uh, time index t for a specific problem size, but uh, later um, I'll, I'll give you sort of a rigorous proof that uh, these statistical properties um, are exact in the, the large system limit for any fixed t. So um, the, 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 the sort of theoretical guarantees I'll ultimately uh, present are, are here to kind of make this idea rigorous. Okay, so, um, right, so uh, to get back to, to sort of the questions we were looking at earlier, right, uh, we were asking um, for an uh, asymptotically exact characterization of uh, the lasso estimator. And um, the AMP theory uh, allows us to, to uh, provide that. So um, if we assume now, we make the additional assumptions that our signal is IID according to some sub-Gaussian distribution, and um, for simplicity I'm going to assume uh, IID normal noise, then um, we can characterize things like uh, the mean square error in our estimate. So this is the mean square error between uh, the lasso estimate and uh, the truth. 
by the fixed point of a pair of equations. Right? So I have two equations here, and um, I'm thinking about uh, tau star and alpha star as being the solutions to those equations. And then um, when we have the unique solution to this pair of equations, we actually get an exact asymptotic characterization of the mean square error. So in the sense that the mean square error uh, of my lasso estimator concentrates on um, the expectation of my soft thresholding function that acts uh, on input determined by this tau star. Um, we'll eventually see that that's the, the limit of the, the state evolution, uh, the, the t limit of the state evolution. Um, and uh, we see that it, it, it uh, uh, concentrates exponentially fast in, um, in the, the problem dimension n. So I've sort of, I've hidden a, a few of the details here. The constants uh, in this concentration depend on, on T, but not N or Epsilon, and um, I'll, I'll look at those a little bit more carefully later. So um, this is a, a result that uh, I have in, in uh, forthcoming, forthcoming work, and it's in fact uh, a, a, a refinement of a result that was originally given by Beati and Montanari back in 2015. So they showed uh, almost sure convergence of uh, my mean squared error here to this expectation, and so um, we can refine that actually with concentration. In both cases, proving this requires demonstrating that the AMP algorithm uh, just introduced converges quickly to the lasso optimum, and also um, that that AMP algorithm can be uh, exactly analyzed. And so uh, what I'm going to do uh, with the rest of the talk is, uh, is talk about how the AMP algorithm can be exactly analyzed. I'm not going to go into the details of how to prove the AMP converges to the lasso optimum. Um, it turns out to be a little bit tricky because the, the, um, uh, the cost function isn't strongly convex. Yeah. Sure, where is yes. The right. So no t here because uh, mean square error between the lasso uh, minima the minimizer and the the uh, truth. So the t. Okay. No. So so um, the the so how do we prove this? Well, we show that beta hat t converges to to beta hat, where beta hat is the lasso optimum. Yeah, so this tau star is actually limb of tau t and t. Thanks, sorry. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, to, or, to analyze the AMP algorithm, uh, it uses the IID-ness uh, um, pretty strongly. Uh, the Gaussianity we can back off from a little bit. Um, there have been some recent sort of work in vector approximate message passing that uh, brings us uh, outside of the IID Gaussian a little bit more, but... Uh, we need rotational invariance of, of A. And so this can, I think, be translated into spectral properties of, of um, like you were saying, yeah. Um, right, okay. Uh, uh, empirically, it works uh, sort of more generally, so Fourier matrices and, and these sorts of things, but we haven't been able to prove that. Okay, so um, uh, the result that I, I just showed uh, actually holds in a little bit more generality 
Um, so there is some work moving beyond IID matrices like you were, you were suggesting. Um, and it actually holds for all pseudo Lipschitz loss functions, just not just the L2 loss. So this is something I'll define in a little bit, but it's a generalization of, of a Lipschitz property. So, uh, the, the, the kinds of loss we can characterize are more general than what I showed. Okay, so um, now I want to move away from the, the AMP framework for the lasso and for compressed sensing and, and uh, look at a more general kind of AMP algorithm. So uh, in the talk so far, um, lasso was motivated by a sparse signal with an unknown uh, signal prior distribution and our goal was to minimize the lasso costs. Um, it turns out that the theorem that I showed do doesn't really require sparsity of the, the assumed prior. Um, it holds whether or not that sub-Gaussian distribution uh, induces sparsity or not. Um, so uh, the first generalization I want to, to look at is, is when we change the problem slightly to where we, we're thinking about our signal as having some known signal prior distribution. Uh, it may or may not induce sparsity. And our goal is to instead minimize the mean square error, right? So if we're looking at, at, at something like this, right, and we have a, uh, we want this to be small, uh, and we have a, a, a sort of uh, non-sparse signal, then we may be able to do uh, better. So um, the AMP algorithm in uh, the general form is, is similar to what we just looked at, but the idea is, is now that we may not want to sort of denoise the effective observation with the soft thresholding function, but instead use uh, uh, some other denoiser. So uh, in our general case, right, what I'm assuming is, is my beta is IID according to some known uh, prior distribution, okay? And in fact, what I'd like to do is minimize the mean square error, right? Um, so if, if beta is not sparse, then using something like the soft thresholding function doesn't make a lot of sense because this is going to give us a sparse result, right? So um, a smart way to choose, uh, a, you know, a, a denoiser in this case um, is, is the following. So we're still going to have this property of the effective observation that it's approximately equal to the truth plus independent Gaussian noise with some variance that we know. So in the case that we know a prior distribution on beta, right, um, a smart denoiser to use in that case, so a smart way to look at this and get a better estimate of uh, beta naught afterwards would be to use a, a Bayes optimal denoiser uh, that calculates the conditional expectation of the signal where we're conditioning on uh, its input having this approximate distribution. Um, and so this Bayes optimal AMP has been studied extensively and this dates back to the, the TAP equations that, that we saw uh, earlier. Um, it turns out that, that even with an unknown signal prior distribution, if uh, you even have partial knowledge about what your signal structure might be, you can generally encode it uh, into some sort of smart denoiser and the theoretical guarantees for AMP uh, will, will still work. Um, so uh, though this, this is sort of the, the smart choice if you know your prior, if you don't, other choices um, work as well uh, under some conditions. So, um, Right, so as I was, I was mentioning, when we use these Bayesian denoisers, so these conditional uh, distribution denoisers, the fixed point uh, version of the AMP algorithm dates back to the, the TAP equations. And um, the, the iterative solutions to these equations were given by uh, Bolthausen uh, in 2014, and this was actually the work that kind of um, allowed uh, Bayati and Montanari to initially um, sort of prove uh, 
uh, rigorously the, the sort of uh, performance guarantees for the, the AMP algorithms. And so the, the work that I'll present um, today uses the same basic uh, proof structure that, that Bolt Halsen used. He had a really brilliant sort of uh, conditioning idea where you, you uh, study this iterative process by treating the A matrix as random and conditioning on the output you've seen up to any time um, T. And this is the workhorse of the, the proofs that we'll use, uh, that we still use now. So um, again, I, I've sort of started talking about uh, the AMP algorithms um, since the, you know, the time that they were popularized. Uh, and you know, I'm a statistician to statisticians uh, when they were motivated by the applications of, of compressed sensing, um, but uh, they have a long history. Okay, so, um, right, so what we've done so far uh, is, is first we looked at, at lasso and, and compressed sensing and the AMP algorithm that we would use there that incorporates a soft thresholding function. And then um, we also looked at a, a generalization where we think of knowing a, a signal prior distribution and wanting to minimize the mean square error, in which case, um, using the, the Bayes optimal denoiser would be a good choice. In both cases, um, it turns out that, that as our problem size gets large for a fixed iteration T, um, AMP uh, admits an asymptotically exact characterization, so a, a characterization of its statistical properties, um, via a, a scalar recursion that we refer to as the, the state evolution. So um, now I take, like to take a look at the, the state evolution. So uh, the idea is the, the following. So if we assume uh, the effective observation has uh, the property that it's approximately equal to the, the truth viewed in, in uh, Gaussian noise, um, then if these tau t terms are decreasing as the algorithm iterates, we're getting a more and more pure view of the, the signal. So obviously, uh, we'd like to study uh, these tau t uh, noise variance terms. And so the state evolution equations are what allow us to do that. And so um, the state evolution is a, a scalar recursion uh, that takes the, the following form. So um, we initialize it using uh, the prior distribution on the signal. And then uh, at any time t, we update it with a function of uh, the variance at time t minus one. So um, at a high level, uh, the, the sort of takeaway here, right, is that this scalar recursion allows us to predict the performance of AMP at any iteration, so long as you uh, believe me when I, I I, I, I say that the, the effective observation has this approximate distribution. Um, so my goal for the last few minutes of the talk will be uh, to show you how we can make this I idea rigorous. And so as a, a note, um, you know, here I've, I've written the state evolution as if we know the prior distribution, but even if you don't know the prior distribution, you can, uh, approximate these tau t values um, with the output of the algorithm itself. So all of, all of this is, is functional without knowledge of the prior distribution, but uh, assuming knowledge of the prior distribution helps us work through some of the, the theory. Okay, so now to, to sort of uh, make uh, these ideas rigorous, um, I first have to make a few additional assumptions um, so in particular, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that my signal is IID sub Gaussian, um, and also that the denoising function that I use in my algorithm, so this was maybe the conditional expectation, uh, if you know the signal prior, or it could be something different like the soft thresholding function, right? But I have to assume that it's, it's um, Lipschitz continuous. 
And then uh, the, the theoretical results are going to be uh, concentration results for pseudo Lipschitz loss functions, where uh, pseudo Lipschitz loss functions have uh, the following form. Um, they're basically a, a generalization of Lipschitz loss that includes things like R squared error loss or our L1 loss. Okay, so then um, we have the, the following uh, guarantee. So uh, for any pseudo Lipschitz loss function, um, the, the, the probability of a delta deviation between the pseudo Lipschitz loss and uh, the AMP output at time t and the truth uh, concentrates to a value I've, I've colored in blue here um, that depends on my state evolution predictions, my signal prior distribution, and the, the denoiser that I use. And so again, um, we're going to have exponentially fast concentration in, in, in my, my problem size. So uh, what this tells us is that uh, at least within pseudo Lipschitz loss functions, uh, we can essentially consider the AMP estimates as having IID entries where each entry uh, looks like a denoised version of the, the truth plus independent Gaussian noise. Um, okay, so, um, right, so to make this concrete, right, we could choose L2 loss. Uh, this is a pseudo Lipschitz loss function, and this again gives us a, a concentration of uh, our, our mean square error, right, to um, a value predicted by the state evolution. Again, um, this refines an asymptotic result that was originally proved by Bayati and Montanari. So via some borel Cantelli argument, you can show that uh, the, the concentration result here um, implies an almost sure convergence result. So um, finally, I'll note that uh, these, these constants that depend on t kind of have a nasty uh, dependence on t. So in particular, there's a t factorial term in there. Um, and so this tells us something about how large t can get uh, in order for the deviation problem to, to still go to zero. And so we need that the t grows pretty quickly uh, with, with, um, with n. And so, um, I'm not going to, to linger on this too much, but at, at some level, these sorts of T factorial terms seem uh, unavoidable in the proof methods we have now that, that is an induction over the, the iterations T of the, the arguments. Yeah. Sure. We had a result about beta half. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and so if you can't take T large enough, how are you sure that beta T is close to beta half? Uh, right, so um, if, you, if you want to... Uh, right, well, so I, I mean, so now I'm kind of thinking of a general AMP that, that maybe we're no longer thinking about optimizing a cost function, right? Um, I mean, yeah, there, right, you, you, you know, if you... If you want, so, you know, uh, in order for the AMP algorithm to find the lasso optimum, if we're using the soft threshold, uh, you have to have T to be sufficiently large, which basically means you have to have insufficiently large in order for the, the concentration to, to hold. Um, you know, it, it, now sort of I'm kind of backing away from that optimization and, and, and thinking about a, a general kind of what can we say about, you know, an algorithm of this form where now I'm just assuming that eta t is some Lipschitz function, right? And it turns out that, that as long as eta t is a Lipschitz function, then, uh, you know, results like this hold. Um, I agree that, that this, you know, 
at some level is is still an asymptotic result, right? Uh, it just gives the the rate. It's it's not as finite sample as as uh, maybe I'd like. Okay, so I'll give a quick sketch of um, the proof. So uh, what we'd like to do with the proof uh, is to sort of just make uh, rigorous this assumption that I've had the whole time, that uh, my effective observation is approximately equal to my, my truth viewed in, in Gaussian noise, where the variance of the noise is given by the state evolution. So um, this is essentially done in, in two steps. So what we'd like to do is characterize the conditional distribution of the effective observation uh, minus the truth, um, conditional on the past output of the algorithm. Okay. And so what we can do is, is we can show that if we look at this uh, difference, right, we'd like for the difference to look like tau tz. And what we can show is that it's equal in distribution to tau tz plus a delta deviation term. And we can do the same thing if you look at the, the residuals that we calculate minus uh, the, the actual noise in the, the problem. We get it as, as some Gaussian term plus uh, a deviation term. Um, so the, the kind of the, the nasty part of, of the proof is the second step where we want to show that these deviation terms are small in the sense that they concentrate uh, to zero. So to do this, this requires an inductive proof over the iteration t. So uh, essentially you show that, you know, um, inner products of the, the uh, output of the AMP algorithm concentrate on known values at time t. So if, if they concentrate at time t, then they also concentrate at time t plus one. Um, and, you know, even uh, it turns out to, to be a mess because these, these deviation terms are, are kind of a mess. Okay, so um, to wrap up, I just wanted to, to um, go through uh, some of the sorts of extensions and generalizations that have been studied. Um, so uh, if we want to look at, at generalized linear models or non-Gaussian noise distributions, uh, Sandeep and uh, some of his co-authors have studied uh, a generalized approximate message passing that, that can handle such models. Um, and then there's been a lot of work on, on different uh, measurement matrices. So can we get away from the IID Gaussian assumption? And it, it, and it turns out, um, we can prove things for IID sub-Gaussian, and then uh, also, you know, the most general at this point uh, is for the, the right orthogonally invariant uh, matrices. Um, there's some work uh, for signals with dependent entries and then non-separable denoisers. Uh, and there are a number of statistical applications. So uh, when we were looking at pseudo Lipschitz loss functions, we were studying things like the mean square error, but it also allows us to study things like um, the type one or type two error in, in various procedures. So for example, the, the lasso or the, the sorted L1 penalty. And um, we can use it uh, in the same way we looked at exact asymptotic uh, guarantees for the lasso. Um, we can also look at different estimators like robust M estimators or the sorted L1 penalty. Um, you know, we looked at the noisy linear regression model, but then there, there's been a lot of work extending this to, to different um, models, including, you know, things like principal component analysis or the, the stochastic block model. Okay, so um, just to, to wrap up, uh, so we looked at the, the high dimensional linear regression problem today, and we looked at a general AMP algorithm for uh, solving uh, the high dimensional linear regression problem when uh, beta is some unknown signal with an IID prior distribution and uh, the, the measurement matrix A is IID Gaussian. So, um, the AMP theory gives us sharp theoretical guarantees 
uh, that are determined by a simple scalar iteration referred to as the state evolution. So in particular, things like the mean square error between uh, the truth and the estimate at any time t concentrates to uh, some value predicted by the state evolution. And so um, even though if we you know, know the signal prior, we have nice ways to, to denoise the function, AMP can be run without uh, knowledge of the, the signal prior. Any sort of structural assumptions can be used to build smart denoisers. And um, the state evolution values can be predicted uh, by you know, uh, the, the, the sort of output of the algorithm itself. Um, so I'll just wrap up uh, with some open questions. Um, so the, 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 a, a large limit of the theoretical results is on the, the IID assumption on the measurement matrix. So um, we have empirical evidence that it works more generally. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is something that, that's an interesting uh, avenue of, of further work. Um, in fact, we know that AMP can diverge uh, kind of wildly outside of IID Gaussian measurement matrices in some cases, and so. Um, so what cases are like that? Yeah, so it, it's. Um, you know, okay, well, so some are a little bit easier than others to deal with. So even if it's just not mean zero, it will diverge. But, you know, you can, in most applications, you can correct that. I guess there are some that, that you can't. Um, in that case, VAMP actually does better, the vector approximate message passing. Um, I mean, I... Uh, Generally, if, if you know, in situations like the the Fourier matrix, if you have like a random Hadamard, um, these things work. Uh, it, it's it's um, it's kind of correlated columns can kind of uh, mess it up as well. So so those are those are the the areas that I know where it it it, it breaks. But you know, again, I don't know if there's like a good understanding of exactly where the limits are. Um, a lot of the, the sort of uh, new work that's happening now is, is developing these methods for um, inference and learning in, in multi-layer models and, and, and deep networks. Um, and then there are some, you know, I think there's, there's room to have a better understanding of the connection between AMP and the, the more classical uh, optimization techniques. Um, so that's uh, all I have today. Thank you for having me. Thanks.